So good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to continue our discussion in heat transfer, wrapping up our introductory discussion and getting uh, into a deeper dive on conductive heat transfer. So from last time, we had talked about the three forms of heat transfer, where, man, I wish I knew why I did that. where we had conduction, which is heat transfer by direct contact. Which is based off of Fourier's law of conduction. Which states the heat transfer rate and conduction is equal to the thermal conductivity, the surface area times the change in temperature divided by the thickness of where heat is being transferred. We also discussed convection, which is heat transfer. due to fluid flow, where heat transfer follows Newton's law of cooling, which states heat transfer by convection is equal to the heat transfer coefficient H times our surface area times our delta T, where delta T was the surface area minus the ambient or surrounding temperature. And just for notes purposes. So we have conduction, convection. So today, I'm gonna to wrap up our introductory discussion. And I'm gonna to try to zoom out to make sure you guys don't get too lost and discuss radiation or radiative heat transfer. So radiation or radiative heat transfer is the energy emission via electromagnetic waves. And as it relates to heat transfer, we focus on thermal emission and thermal radiation. So when it comes to radiative heat transfer, we can state that the radiation heat transfer flux can be equal to some constant, which we designate sigma, times a temperature gradient but we find that radiative heat transfer scales with the temperature gradient to the fourth power. And our constant 
is known as the Stefan Boltzmann constant. which equals 5.67 times 10 to the minus four watts per meter squared, Kelvin to the fourth. <laughs> so one thing we find with heat transfer via radiation is most systems demonstrate what's known as an imperfect radiation emission. And so this expression actually describes what's known as the maximum possible radiative emission for a system based on a given gradient. And so we can define the actual radiation emission flux over the maximum as an empirical value known as epsilon, where epsilon equals the emissivity of our body or object, which can have a value between zero and one. And I can define emissivity is how closely an object resembles a black body where a black body is capable of maximum radiation emission. And so, you know, in, in more layman's terms, substances are incapable of emitting the maximum amount of radiation possible governed by our radiative expression. And so there's a corrective factor known as emissivity that describes the objects, the persons, the body's ability to emit radiation. And so it's basically compared by the maximum amount. And so what we can describe is the, black, the maximum flux a radiative flux is also known as the black body emission or black body radiative flux. And so for, for an emissivity is one, the object or the emission is considered black body radiation. And so we can get, as in this system, we have sigma times our surface area times the rate between the surface to the fourth minus the ambient or surrounding to the fourth. So this is the maximum or black body radiation emission. For everything else, we can define heat transfer by radiation as the emissivity times sigma times the surface area times the surface temperature minus the ambient and or surrounding temperature. And since we rarely deal with black bodies because we're not physics majors, this is gonna be the expression that you're gonna wanna kind of keep in the back of your mind and at the forefront of your notes when it comes to radiative heat transfer. Now, one thing I do want to note. Um, Dr. Lopez? Yes, sir. So with this emissivity, 
is this something we look up in a table? Um, yes, this is going to be a value that will be obtained given the substance. So in general, this is an intrinsic value. Okay, thank you. Of course, good question. One other thing I want to note is that the temperatures or should I say temperature values must be used or given as absolute temperatures. And so what that means is you know, if I'm taking 20 degrees Celsius to the fourth power, that's very different than if I take 293 Kelvin to the fourth power. And when it comes to the Stelf and Boltzmann constant, which I realize this value is wrong, I apologize, glad I caught that. It's 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. No idea why I wrote four, I apologize. So please make sure that you correct that value now. So if you use relative temperatures, your values are gonna be extremely incorrect. So any questions over radiative heat transfer? Like I said, we don't do a whole lot with it in this class, primarily because as it applies to chemical engineering, process engineering, it is it's applicable, but it's not how we essentially design heat transfer equipment. And so if there's time at the end of this course, well, we can do a little bit deeper dive, but when it comes to heat transfer equipment, heat exchangers, radiative heat transfer is not the mechanism of interest. I will say that it is, you know, for those that are, um, really interesting heat transfer as well as into um, physics. It's, it's really, really neat stuff. So with that in mind, let's work an example as practice in applying radiative heat transfer principles. So let's consider a person standing in a room maintained at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's determine the rate of heat transfer via radiation between the person and the surrounding surfaces if the exposed surface area of the person is approximately 15 square feet and the temperature of the, or the surface temperature, I should say, of the person is 92 degrees Fahrenheit. The internal temperature was 92 degrees, I think he'd be in trouble. All right, I'll give you guys a couple seconds to write down any of the information and then I'll switch it back to the notes. All right, so this is an example of radiative heat transfer. So from that, we know that Q radiation is sigma epsilon times our surface area times our surface temperature to the fourth minus our ambient temperature to the fourth. So the surface temperature of the person was approximately 92 Fahrenheit, which for ease and simplicity of doing the problem, Let's look at it in terms of Celsius and Kelvin. So 92 degrees Fahrenheit is 330.3 degrees Celsius. The ambient temperature given was approximately 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which 20 degrees Fahrenheit should be approximately, wait, did I say 20 degrees Fahrenheit? That should be wrong. 75, okay. excuse me. I apologize. It is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 
0.9 Celsius. So in Kelvin, what we're looking at is 306.3 Kelvin. and 296.9 Kelvin. Now, sigma, as I stated earlier and corrected, is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. The surface area provided was 15 square feet, which if I want to convert that to square meters, I get approximately 1.39 square meters. So that leaves us figuring out what is the sigma for our person. So from that, a couple of things we can do. We can look it up or we can play a game I like playing games, so we're gonna play a chemical engineering version of Price is Right. So my question for you all is, what is the epsilon value of a person? Let's see who can go closest without going over. Who wants to volunteer? I volunteer. All right, Blake, what are your, what are your thoughts? I'm just going to guess uh, 0.73. Oh, that's a good guess. So Blake says 0.73. Anybody else want to volunteer? I'll guess 0.4. All right. Is that you, John? Yeah. Perfect. 0.4. All right. Anybody else want to take a couple guesses? 0.83. All right, Levi says 0.83. All right. One more guess. Let's see how y'all do. One. All right. Is that you, James? Yeah, but I, I go by Gray. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You say Greg or Gray? Gray, G R A Y. Thank you. I, I apologize. So I'm going all in saying it's one. I got some chat. We'll oh, see it. We'll let the chat participate. What do we got? Uh oh, where'd the chat go? Is the chat not working? All right, I got, okay, I got quite a few from the chat. Why is the chat not showing up when I'm sharing? Now I feel like a boomer. Oh, great. There we go, I figured it out. So Aaron says 0.567. I got Michael 0.76. Bailey says 0.79. Miranda, Scott, point nine. All right, y'all are y'all are participating. I give that. I like that. I appreciate it. So the correct answer we find might surprise you. The answer for a human, and this is human skin now, it does change if you're wearing, you know, depending on the materials of, of clothing you're wearing. But for typical human skin, what we find is about 0.95 to 0.98. So good news is, or the bad news is, is that the matrix had some ring of truth in it and that we are very good at thermal radiation emission. So who was the closest without going over? Gray, you were so close, but you went over. So like my wins. I think missed Jared. Oh, did Jared have something in the chat? I think he had it on the money. Oh, he did have it on the money. All right. Look at you being kind. 
All right, so 10 points to Jared. So with that in mind, we'll use 0.95. And with that, we can solve this problem. So we have 0.95 for our emissivity, 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared, Kelvin to the fourth. The surface area is 1.39 square meters. And the surface temperature was approximately 306.3. Kelvin to the fourth minus 296.9 Kelvin to the fourth. If we do all of that, we find that the emission via radiation is 834 watts. Any questions on that? So where would we find like um, the list of like emissities? Because when Ryan asked earlier, you said you usually find the value in a table somewhere. Yeah, engineering toolbox has a bunch of coefficients. I'm sure Perry's, if you really wanted to get lost in that, may may have some information on it. But I, I like to use modern tools instead of staring at a 7,000 page book for three hours. Modern problems require modern solutions. Modern problems do require modern solutions. That's very true. And so, you know, if, if we were gonna take a really good look at this problem, right, we have our person standing here, he's happy. And, you know, we were considering the radiative heat transfer, right? However, we also have to consider, in addition to there being radiation, there may also and most likely will be convective heat transfer as well. And so if we were interested in finding the total heat transfer, we would consider not only the radiative heat transfer, but also the convective heat transfer that exists on that um, person. Dr. Lopez? Yes. I'm not positive, but I think you may have used the 15 feet as your surface area as opposed to the 1.39 meters squared. No, it's 1.39. Maybe I probably made a calculator error then. Okay. I can double check right. if you'd like. I don't mind doing that. Or let's see, you may be right, because my notes show 15, even though I only look at my notes very little these days. So 296.9 to the fourth, that's a big number. All right, so I think you are right. Because now I have 77.3 watts. That's what I got. Thank you for looking. No, thank you for letting me know. The class this well, yesterday did not correct me. And I'll be honest, one thing that I don't like is when students don't correct me. And they get in a tiffy after the fact that I'm like, well, you should have been paying, working with me and correcting me. So I, I do appreciate that sincerely. So if, if we're really looking at this person with amazing superpowers um, and we want to consider, you know, the total heat transfer that exists between a person, we not only have to consider the radiation, but also the convection, right? Where the convective heat transfer is going to be a function of that surface and surrounding temperature. And so in this case, we would be most likely interested in identifying, you know, the heat transfer coefficient between the ambient air and the person in the room. So for example, if I assumed that the H, 
it being a still room, probably small, 2.8 watts per meter squared Kelvin. I can also state that the convective heat transfer that exists in the person follows this. Now in this point, we really don't need to worry about absolute, we can use relative, but if we want, we can use Kelvin, you'll get the same value. And so with this in mind, we can identify, well, what would be an approximation for the convective heat transfer that exists between the person and the room. So in this, I find a value of approximately 36.6 watts, which if I added it to our 77.3, I can state then about 113.9. And so, you know, I, I, I take this tangent to kind of make you aware that there are some problems where you have to consider what are the heat transfer systems that are involved. And in addition, I can ask, well, what are the directions? Uh, uh, another example that you can consider is what if the person is outside? such that now you're considering a person and we might find that the radiative heat transfer exists can occur in the direction on the person due to solar radiation. At the same time, you can have the person emitting radiation to the ambient and you can have convective heat transfer from the person to the ambient. And so for this instance, the total heat transfer would be the radiative heat transfer that exists due to solar radiation, right? Assuming they're standing in the sun, minus the radiative heat transfer that exists from the person, minus the convective heat transfer. from the person to the surroundings. And so it's important in, in based on a problem statement to identify what are the forms of heat transfer as well as the sources that exist, as well as what are the directions of those heat transfer rates. And by convention, if we're talking about heat transfer, uh, I would say that heat transfer is positive if done by the system. Actually, let me rewrite this and I'll draw it to make it a little clear. Heat transfer is positive if done on the system or object by the surroundings. and heat transfer is negative if done by the surrounding system to the surroundings. And it's, it's a little confusing because it, it is the opposite of the work convention. And so if you know, this box is my system or my object. And then I draw my system boundary. Any Q going in is positive and any Q going out is negative. So 
So keep that in mind, which is why when I developed this expression above about the person standing outside, the solar radiation is acting on the person, so I consider that positive, and the person's emitting both radiation and convection, so those two values should be negative. If so in the, the temperature, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If the temperature of the surroundings was above the temperature of the person, would the Q convection become positive? It can, yes. Yeah, so if the if the if the ambient temperature basically rises above the surface temperature of the person, then it would become positive. Which is why if if you ever talk to Dr. Scavazzo and he comes and visits from time to time, he, he gets mad when people drive motorcycles in really hot weather and they refuse to wear any protective gear because it's hot. Where when we'll we'll discuss when you have that temperature gradient and then you move at a high velocity, you're essentially making the problem worse for yourself. So that's you know kind of um, the key concepts associated with um, convection, conduction and radiation that I wanted to discuss in this segment. What I'd like to do now is move on and, and do a little deeper dive, probably for the end of the week, on conductive heat transfer. But before I do that, do you guys have any further questions <clears throat> or confusion or anything that I can further clarify for you? Dr. Lopez, I had a question. Yes. So if you were going to, um, so I know we kind of calculated in that problem the heat transfer out of the human body, but if you were going to look at the heat transfer from that source into a distant object, how would you account for the distance? Well, what I can tell you is for radiative heat transfer, it is the only form of heat transfer that exists and can occur without a transfer medium. Right, that's why we can receive solar radiation through the vacuum of space. And so when it comes to heat transfer via radiation, the distance is meaningless. All that matters is the intensity of radiation that is received on the other end. If that, that makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Right, the only thing the distance can do is dissipate that energy due to absorption of the medium between the system and the source, right? And, you know, the air and the atmosphere absorb some of the energy, which is why we don't, you know, instantly bake when we go outside due to all the harmful uh, radiation that, can, that is emitted from the sun. Um, and at the same time, the distance reduces the actual intensity of that radiation emission. Right, because it's you know follows a, a square law. Square with the distance decreases the intensity of emission. And no, that's a good question. All right. If that's all we have then. And let's consider heat transfer by conduction one more time. Now, an exploration of heat transfer can go from a very simple one-dimensional analysis to a very complicated multi-dimensional transient system um, very quickly. What I mean by that is, for, if I'm honest, for most of this class, we're going to be doing very high level overviews, where most often than not, when it comes to conductive heat transfer, we consider things in a one dimensional sense. Where if I'm looking at, let's say, a, a wall, 
and I have some temperature on the outside, some temperature on the inside. I most often do not in considering, well, what's the conduction that I can expect through the wall? This highly differs, even if I'm looking at that same wall, but I'm considering a more multi-dimensional analysis that can exist. Where instead of considering things in the bulk and assuming that everything is uniform in the y and z directions, I can say, okay, if I have some average temperature on the an average temperature on the inside, what can I expect in terms of temperature profiles that can emerge within my system? And so very quickly, let's say I take a point here, right? This is my point A. If I were to expand that point, I can consider, well, what is the heat transfer that not only exists in the x direction, and I'm just saying q in, q out, I really shouldn't, I should really just say q x, q x plus delta x. I can also consider q y, q y plus delta y. And at the same time, right, QZ, QZ plus delta C. And so in order to get a truly accurate idea of the anticipated heat transfer, if I'm considering a multidimensional system, I have to identify the various sources of heat transfer in, in all three dimensions both going into that system from the x direction, y direction, and z direction, as well as leaving that system in the x, y, and z directions. And so you can imagine just trying to do a Q here at A is essentially Q x minus Q x plus delta x plus Q y minus Q y plus delta y plus q z minus q z plus delta z. And so this is very different versus the assumption of a one dimensional system. And this is simply for point A. If I have point B, then I have to consider a second point. And so you can imagine trying to do an analysis over this entire wall very quickly becomes a rather tedious and complicated system. And so, you know, what, what you have to do is essentially what I'm drawing here. You, def, you identify and break your object into a set of nodes, identify the heat transfer that exists going from one node to another, and essentially do that over the entire surface of the object. This is what's known as nodal analysis. And so I, I would, you know, see Sengal text for more information. We're not going to get into that. It would take probably two to three weeks to teach nodal analysis. We're really going to focus on one dimensional heat transfer. Primarily because we don't have three weeks to teach you nodal analysis. But I, I bring it to your attention to let you know that a lot of the essentially tools and techniques that I'm going to teach you in this course are very introductory. It's, it's there to give you a sense of how heat transfer occurs. In most systems. However, I do want to make you aware that there are more complicated and more um, 
precise techniques that, that can be used depending on the nature of a system. And in addition to looking at one dimensional systems, we can consider steady state versus transient systems. We lost the one note. Oh, yeah. you did. Thank you for letting me know. I'm bringing it back. Where we can consider an object, like I said, right, where the Q is not going to change with time versus how the temperature changes that emerges. due to heat transfer. And so what I will tell you is we will do some discussion on transient heat conduction. We won't really get into it for convection or radiation. However, there are some simplifications we can make in conductive heat transfer um, that can be kind of taught in an efficient manner suitable for this course. And so what we're going to start and talk about today is transient conductive heat transfer. On Friday, I hope to get into, excuse me, today we'll talk about steady state. On Friday, I hope to get into transient systems. And so from there, I stated previously that the flux via conduction can be related to our thermal conductivity times our temperature gradient, right? For one dimensional system, I can express it like this. The change in flux is related to thermal conductivity times K times the gradient in the X direction. For a multi-dimensional systems, we find a similar approach where instead of just looking in the X direction, we look at all directions or we can simply designate it as the upside down triangle, right? Where this is the full gradient function that exists in the X, Y, and Z direction. And so, however, we're engineers, we like to figure out more simplified and, and efficient tools for doing our calculations. And so we said for one dimensional system, we can find the conductive heat transfer by the thermal conductivity, the surface temperature, a comparison of the driving force via two points or a delta T over the thickness of an object, delta X. However, we can also consider this in addition to an analysis of thermal conductivity, surface area, and thickness. We can write this in a form that looks like this, where the conductive heat transfer is directly related to the gradient delta T and inversely related to what is known as our total thermal thermal resistance. and specifically our conductive resistance, which based off the expressions provided in Fourier's law of conduction, we can state our conductive resistance is simply the thickness of our object over the thermal conductivity times the surface area, which has units of Let's say we have length divided by watts per Kelvin length squared. 
or more simply, we end up with what's known as temperature per energy, or simply in SI, it would be Kelvins per watt. And in the English system, it would be hours, degree Fahrenheit, per BTU. Wait, where does the time come into this for imperial units? Well, watts is a joule per second. So it's an energy per unit time. BTU is an energy, so we need the per unit time. Got it. Yep. Oh, wow, well, I wrote that very wrong. No, no, I wrote it right. I'm, getting, I'm making myself confused, I apologize. In addition, we can write a similar expression for convection where we can find that our convective resistance for heat transfer is simply our heat transfer coefficient divided by our surface area, which has the same units. And so this is useful when considering multi-component systems. And so instead of having, let's say, a, a simple wall, if I have a multi-component object composed of several materials, right? So this is considering a composite material with varying thicknesses. I can consider the heat transfer that it can exist through each layer. We're about out of time, so I'll leave you with this question to consider for next time. And it's a simple yes or no question. So I'll say, will the heat transfer rate in the x direction be the same? for each layer. So you can think about it and consider it. And we'll discuss it further on Friday. Any last minute questions? If not, thank you guys for your attendance. Sorry we didn't get a little further than I had hoped, but I'm sure we'll be able to at least complete steady state conduction on Friday. We may or may not get to transient conduction. So I'll do a double check to make sure the assignments that I provided don't delve into transient conduction just yet. So stay tuned. I'll probably send an update email here in an hour or two. But if not, take Thank care, you. guys, and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.